Hello and welcome to Cinema Eclectica, part of the Geek Show's uh, podcast Cosmoverse. I just coined that. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, <laughs> orbiting the main star of the Geek Show, we are the small planetoid that reviews movies. I'm Graham and this week I've been joined by... By Rob. Indeed. And if you enjoy our podcasts, if this isn't your first rodeo with us and want to keep us going, you can donate to our Patreon. We are at www.patreon.com forward slash the geek show. Or if you're you know, not quite ready to give us money yet, if you're on the fence, if you're eclectic or curious, as I believe <laughs> it's called, uh, you can just give us a review on anywhere you get your podcasts, iTunes, Acast, Podbean, anywhere. It does help us uh, become a bit more visible. Uh, or just follow us on social media. Our screen name is TGS underscore The Geek Show, and we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. As far as the reviews, though, as well as it being helpful for finding us, it's also a great way to give us feedback, say what you like, yeah. what you don't. You know, it's nice to know this stuff. And we, we will read them out. So, you know, if you've ever wanted to make us say your really stupid screen name, that's a goal <laughs> you can achieve. <laughs> yes. So this is one of a th- <laughs> one of those things that I didn't really imagine we'd be making a semi-regular feature of. But hey, 2020 be 2020 ying. Uh, and everything is out on streaming now, so we are having our new streaming special. Yes, which is basically every movie now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like every other movie. It's literally every movie is a streaming movie, which, just on that point, I think it's really interesting for cinema, you know, because mm. we're living in a small town, and a small mining town, or former mining town in the north east of England. Mm. There's only times where you thought, here's a new independent movie, can't see that, not showing anywhere near us, have to go on an 80 mile round trip to see it. Yeah. Whereas this, it's sort of um, democratised different movies, so it's not just what's on at the, the multiplex. It's... And it, yeah, and it's coming, fortunately it's coming an absolute banner year for foreign cinema releases in the UK. I mean, before everything shut down, you'd already had the holy trinity of Parasite, Baccarat and Portrait of a Lady on Fire. And it's probably those three films turned a lot of people on to foreign language cinema, and now they have the opportunity to see more of it. Hmm. I will start, though, with something which is none of those things. Excellent. We've we've set it up, and now we've pushed <laughs> over the structure, and it's fallen into a big mess on the floor. I'll loop back around so the structure, you know, climbs back together, and <laughs> for a triumphant finish, uh, it's Achieves success against all odds. Excellent. I believe in you. You're like Rocky to me. <laughs> the first one is by an Australian director called Kitty Green, mm. who was previously responsible for uh, casting John Bonet from a few years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, interestingly titled, I'm assuming it's a documentary given the title, but uh, Ukraine is not a brothel. She's also been... Oh, I've, I've wanted uh, to see that for quite a while. That does look very interesting. It's about the slightly divisive, questionably feminist campaigning group Femin. It does look very naughty and thorny. <laughs> okay. I like, a, I like some... kind of is the same. Though. I like some naughty thorns. I'm fine with that. Well, there's a place for them, you know, in yeah. cinema. I mean, I've... What I'm watching now is The Assistant. And as I was doing a little bit of research, as who's who and what's what, it's been received quite badly. It's got 1.7 on Google. I know that's a great metric for <laughs> movie scores. Yes. But I think is there are two reasons for this. It's The Assistant, um, and I'll get to the reasons. Mm. Anyhow, it's, it stars Julia Garner as a assistant in a film... Oh, a studio, a production studio in New York. Yeah. And it's just a day in the life of. It's very slow paced. Mm. Um, I don't think there's a way that you can really do days in the life movies without coming across as a little bit slow. That's fair, yeah. 
um, I think there's there's an industrial reason for that, though. It's because TV documentaries have kind of co-opted the idea of day in life stories. Yeah. If a film wants to do the same sort of tale, it has to change tack, be a bit more... Um, in, well, in see, that was the word. Look inwards, you know, to find the stories rather than just do what it's always done. Yeah, I get that. It reminds me a bit of when the Florida Project by Sean Baker came out and everyone reviewed it and said, oh, it's documentary style. Whereas, as he pointed out, it's filmed using like static cameras on tripods and it's very carefully composed. What you mean is it's a kind of a day in the life film. Yeah. Um, and this one, it, another aspect of it, which uh, is a surefire way to... Oh, how can I wear this? I know the internet, I think it's just <laughs> it straightforward. Yeah. Is It's essentially a Me Too movie. Mm. Um, Julia Gardner is an assistant in the office, and gen- on, a, on a pure day-to-day level of doing this job... Mm. It's just the depiction of a miserable young woman. Yeah. And she's treated like dirt by everybody. I mean, even when she's got to apologise, her co-workers basically apologise for her. She just basically let her clean up and be another person on the on the line. Mm. Which, without sort of the political aspect to it, is pretty bleak. So it's no surprise that this character, this, this arc of the movie is quite... Dower is quite slow paced because there's, there's no joy in this this poor girl's life. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, it implies rather explicitly that the head of the office is quite abusive. Yeah. Um, there's a young another young girl appears out of nowhere. Uh, the producer puts her up in a hotel, mm. and then he just disappears. Right. Pretty explicit what it's implying there. Yeah, I think we've uh, we've all read things like the New Yorkers Harvey Weinstein reportage. We recognise what the implication is there. Yeah, and uh, the members of staff in the office as well joke about it, which uh, I'm not going to highlight it because, you know, it's a very sensitive mm. subject and I'm the wrong person to be talking about that, really. Nonetheless... um. As far as depicting sort of the abusive relationships that are held by those in power in the film industry, I mean, this could be any industry, really. It could be theatre, it could be politics. Yeah. It's essentially some young woman who's trodden underfoot with manipulation and uh, psychological tricks and gaslighting. Mm. Which could... I mean, it's another thing that the internet doesn't like, you know... Representing downtrodden people's perspective. It's weird, so that, isn't I can it? understand. Yeah. I can understand why people wouldn't like it, but at the same time, it's not meant to be flashy. It's not meant to be showy. Mm. It's just meant. It's just meant to be. Yeah. You know, and I don't think there's any other way this movie could really be. To be honest, um, it's kind of like a New York indie version of the play, I guess. Yeah. Because it's got like quite a few cameos from from named actors. Uh, yeah. Matthew McFadden's in there. You have oh, what names? Names. He was in the Conjuring movies. His name's on the tip of my oh, tongue. Oh, uh, Patrick Wilson. Patrick Wilson. There we are. There's a blink and you miss it cameo for him. Um. So it gives it sort of a sensation of being part of a of a reality. Mm. So you can understand that. Even though these stories were happening, these are like famous celebrities were just on the cusp of it, so mm, yeah, it's like the most known secret, but still, nobody really wanted to shake the boat, yeah. So, yeah, it's a necessary movie, but it's not a particularly enjoyable one. Mm. But I don't think there's another way to tell this story other way, otherwise, you know, it has to be done this way. There's one player in this book, and this is it. Yeah, I think that's true. I I can imagine that if something like the Harvey Weinstein scandal had broken in a different era, that someone would have tried to tell it as a kind of rise and fall of a movie producer story, and it would have been insanely tawdry. So, Yeah. yeah, maybe there's not only one way, but there's only one good way. 
Yeah, I think that's what irks me so much about the big shot, to be honest, because mm. that story about the economic crisis of 2008 is fairly shocking Yeah, on its own. But the style of it is so alienating, so condescending, so smarmy that it just bugged me, really. And it's one of those things, isn't it, where... I mean, I like the big shot a bit more than you, but I think it's got its problems. And I think for all people talked about it as a great step forward in how Hollywood dealt with the economic crash, it is still a story about, you know, people in pinstripe suits shouting at each other in Manhattan penthouses. You know, the, the, the challenge of depicting the actual lived reality of the people who suffered because of this still seems to be completely beyond Hollywood. Yeah, and this is totally beyond, like, stylistically and the way it's executed, it's, it's very much on Hollywood. Mm. Um, it's more, oh, maybe it's like a neo-realist sort of uh, movie in style. Yeah. So I can imagine that, that is a great deal of why it doesn't jive with a lot of people, but the, at the core of it is is Julie Garner, Julia Garner, sorry, it's such a a sad dog of a performance, really. <laughs> yes, that's not the right term. It's just, but you know what I mean. It's, it's um, yeah, it, it it garners sympathy. No pun intended. Oh, oh yes, entirely. Um, and hopefully that's like a coming out party for her because she's got all the talent in the world. That young actress, and uh, mm. yeah, very very good. But it's it's a it's say in this term, but it's a message movie. Yeah. But I think it's also dramatically nourishing, and there's a point in some of these movies where it becomes a message movie where the message kind of suffocates everything else. Mm. But the performance aspect of this and the, the sort of little character bits uh, and the sort of the, the very European style, I think there's an audience for this. Yeah. But I don't think it's really found it yet. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I, I've, I'd wanted to see this for a while, and I would have seen it had I not had a, a bit of a um tech problems the week that I was going to do it. In the end I ended up reviewing adult life skills, which was probably better for my mental health and blood pressure. Um Yeah, yeah. But it does strike me as it's the sort of story where you would read about a story like this in the paper and think, huh, I wonder how people in that situation coped with it. And generally, those voices of the people sort of trying to make their way in this unjust system are the ones that don't get films made about them. So I'm pleased that it, people are starting to see the dramatic potential of that. Yeah, on that point, though, I think another reason why it might have been uh, received poorly by certain quarters is because there's this Hollywood idea that the bad producer man has to get his comeuppance at the end. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's and what's that... always held like Hollywood political films back than needs to make it into a story with goodies and baddies. Yeah, and, and if it did that, I think it would be missing the point entirely yeah. because the whole essence of this movie is so many types of these stories went untold, unnoticed for yeah. so long and nobody did anything. And if it had like a hero coming in to save the day and the big bad man was put in prison at the end of it, not really the point, yeah. I think. But that's uh, the assistant anyway. So I've got something which is brand new, uh, fresh off the shelves. This would have come out in, I think it was penciled in to come out in cinemas in early May? maybe early April, uh, but anyway, it's debuted uh, on various online platforms, modern films have it, BFI player have it, and I had to see it because it is the new film by Werner Herzog. Of course you did, Graham. <laughs> Always an event did. around my gaff. Um, <laughs> this premiered at the 2019 Cannes Film Festival. It has the a title that is very curious, although not in the way that Herzog's titles are often curious. This is called Family Romance LLC, and it's inspired loosely by an article in the New Yorker by 
Elif Batcherman, a great essayist who I'm, uh, I'm familiar with. I've never read any of her novels, but I think her essays are great. About a Japanese company called Family Romance, which rents out people to act the part of, say, a parent or a brother or even a friend or even just a fan. If you have the need for someone to be something in your life, they will hire out an actor to, to be that person for a fixed length of time. And it's a very odd idea. It's a very alienated, strange idea. It reminded me in its basic concept of a couple of films. It's a bit like Alps, which was the last film Yorgos Lanthimos did before he left Greece. It's also, although this points up how much the style of it is different, but it's also a bit like Holy Motors in the sort of quieter bits of Holy Motors, like the bit with the girl going home from the party. I'll be honest, Holy Motors is just... It's it's like asking someone to remember that time they took cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a crazy night, man. It's happened. <laughs> yes. I suppose the, the common connection is that Denis Levant in Holy Motors is being asked to to method act almost the role of people in society who are sometimes extraordinary. I think Monsieur Baird is he's a pretty fascinating guy. Um, but most of the time yeah. are just kind of banal. And part of the strangeness of that film is that you don't know why anyone would hire someone to act this part. And even though in Family Romance LLC you have very clear reasons why uh, Yuchi, the person uh, who is our protagonist, is being hired to play these parts. There is still this air of mystery clinging to it. You never quite know what's real. You don't know what the parameters of his relationship with the other people who he is working for is. Yuchi Ishii is played by, uh, in a remarkable stretch, Yuchi Ishii, literally, seriously, the guy who runs family romance in real life. Um, is pl- Wow, that's, yeah. that's incredibly Werner Herzog. Yes. I mean, he's a very good actor, but given his job, you'd have to be. Well, yeah, I mean, this is the guy who hypnotised his cast. Yes, so... yeah. Casting the guy to play the actual real guy in real life in his movie is is very much within his wheelhouse. And I mean, back in his seventies heyday, in particular, Herzog very rarely worked with big name actors. He he worked with Klaus Kinski and very few others. Almost like the experience put him off or something. How could that possibly happen, <laughs> Graham? How could? that possibly happened. <laughs> but in the classic example is when he made the enigma of Casper Hauser about the true case of a man who was released from captivity. Uh, he got a guy who was known only as Bruno S, a street musician, who really what, did spend the early years of his life in an incredibly bleak orphanage under the Nazis. So he, he wants that sense of reality more than he wants something that, you know, feels like an Oscar winning performance, even though, of course, his performances are still incredibly convincing and successful on their own terms. So Family Romance begins in Japan in the springtime. It's Herzog's first film, I think, that is set wholly in Japan. Uh, and I suppose you could argue that if you're going to make one film in Japan, you might as well go during cherry blossom season. Oh yeah, it's absolutely stunning. Yeah, and uh, and it is here too. And the first thing we see is Yuchi going over to a twelve-year-old girl and saying, oh, "You probably don't recognise me. Um, we haven't seen each other for a long time, but I'm your father." And they talk to each other and they go out to see some uh, actors in the park who are doing a kind of a historical reenactment from the samurai era and do a lot of sort of wholesome dad and daughter stuff. And of course, 
uh, the 12-year-old girl is not actually his child. He's been hired to play this figure in uh, her life. Okay. And we see her... Uh, we, we see him play other roles. We see him in a couple of very comic scenarios, like when a worker who was just screwed up on the Japanese train service and he screwed up and he sent a, a train off 20 seconds early, which is the kind of screw up that I think most people who live in Britain would love to see our railways uh, <laughs> collapse into more often. Um, oh, yeah, but in there, it's like a national catastrophe, you know. Yeah. It's so scheduled on the second. It's yeah. Scary. And and that, yeah, and that comes through. So the guy who let the train off early hires Yuchi to play him so his boss can bollock him, which... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's another very odd scene where he has to... Uh, be the dead body for a funeral where the casket cannot be open for some reason or other and he's talking this over with the funeral director and saying it's uh, it's kind of tight is there room in it for me to breathe comfortably and the funeral director says reasonably uh, we've never really investigated that before <laughs> So there's, there's a kind of black comedy edge to it, but there's also a, a sort of deep sadness. And I think the sense of it as being a film about alienation and about loneliness and about not really knowing uh, whether your connections are real or not is never far from the surface. This is, of course, a thing that is partly about the internet age. There is a scene where Yuchi and some of his co-workers are hired to play paparazzi for an aspiring celebrity to put up on her Instagram page and show everyone how she can't walk down the street without being photographed these days. Uh, so that's in there. There is also, although I was pleased that this was uh, played back a bit because it can be something which is overstated in analyses of Japan from foreigners, but it is also about the sense of Japan as being a very consensus-driven, very conformist society where there are, as in that instance with the train, serious penalties for, um, for even very minor mistakes. And as I say, Yuchi is a very good actor. I kept thinking throughout it all, if... He has been approached by these people to play all of these different roles in their lives. How did Herzog approach him? What What is Herzog's role? What has Herzog hired Yuchi to be in the context of Herzog's life? And I think I got my answer when he goes to a hotel that is staffed by partly staffed by experimental robots. So when you check in, the person saying, here is your key, have a nice stay, is actually a, a very creepy looking robot. And first thing I thought is you could not pay me enough money in the world to stay there. These things look like they will murder you in your sleep. <laughs> but the second thing I thought was uh, you Yuchi... So starts talking to the hotel's owner and he says, these robots, do you think they'll come a day when they can dream? Oh, oh my God, Herzog has hired Yuchi to be him. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, lo and behold. Yes. He did exactly that, didn't he? He did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite a fun point. And there, there were lots of fun things uh, in there for long-time Herzog devotees. I think in, in terms of its wider style, it has pluses and minuses. It is shot very documentary style. Uh, some people at the initial can screening, in fact, thought it was a documentary, and you can very easily see why it is unusually convincing. There is a scene where... Uh, Yuchi and one of his associates befriend a girl and like not not a girl who they who was hired them, not a girl who was had anyone in her family hire them. They just seemed to just take this girl on a day out for no apparent reason and there were a few people going, 
did did Werner the Herzog film people kidnapping a child there? <laughs> Herzog, of course. Well, it'd be a first for him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in interviews, he has said, oh, oh, this is uh, fantastic because it shows how realistic the film is and how true it looks. Uh, well, it's also a bit because everyone thinks you're mad, but, you know. <laughs> um, it is very rough and ready. Uh, I think mm. sometimes the challenge of filming in a big metropolis is... It's visibly not something that Herzog is quite used to. There's a lot of intrusive, like, crowd noise and room noise in some scenes, which I guess is just a problem you don't face when, you know, most of your films are made in the middle of the Peruvian jungle or somewhere. Uh, But I'll tell you what I did like about it, is that, in going to Japan and including a lot of things like the cherry trees, like the samurai reenactments, like that overhead shot of the pedestrian crossings that has to be in every single film shot by an outsider about Japan. He does a lot of this, but he doesn't seem to be trying to do it in a Japanese style, which I appreciated, you know, it would be very easy for him to go to Japan and make a film full of, like, Ozu or Koreeda uh, rip-offs, but he, he has kept true to his own vision. If it feels like any other country's cinema, it feels like a lot of the Iranian New Wave films that Herzog is a, okay. a very big fan of, in that they also have this very subtle, very naturalistic kind of interplay between fact and fiction, I know Herzog has talked about Kiwistami's Where Does the Friend's House as being one of his favourite films. I also kept thinking of Mohsen Makhmulbath's uh, A Moment of Innocence, which, as I say, also has this very gentle slippage between reality and fiction that is so subtle you almost don't notice it. Um, So, yeah, I I, I did enjoy it. I think it's one of the strongest dramatic features he's put in in some time. And it also has a fantastic score by Ernst Reisinger, who I know this is almost like Herzog blasphemy to say this, but uh, I think Ernst Reisinger's scores for Herzog's films are my favourite Herzog scores, perhaps even better than the Popolver scores from his 70s and 80s work. Uh, But it's a very strong, strange, sad, haunting, unusual film, certainly rough around the edges, uh, but it's got a lot going for it, and that's Family Romance LLC by Werner Herzog. One thing, there's two observations there. Mm. Um, One, I'm so happy that Werner Herzog is is similar to many of his peers who came to prominence in the 70s, mm. um, where they're, they're getting on, and the movies they make aren't... Yeah. Well, let's just say in music, once a, a person hits a certain age in music and you got people making the music in the 60s, 70s, it becomes very... The edges are sort of cut off and yeah. sanded off. Yeah, yeah. But in me in movies, he's like along with Martin Scorsese, uh, William Freaking. There's loads of them yeah. who are totally committing to who made them, what made them, you know, tick. Oh, completely. And I always say, I mean, there's this school of thought that uh, every director is best in their early work when they're still fresh. I, I kind of get where that comes from, but I don't think that's true. I think that test of a truly great director is how good are the films they make when they're in their 70s yeah there's a quote from uh, the Brian De Palma documentary De Palma in Mm. which he says the best work a director makes is between the ages of 30 and 50 I can understand why he says that Mm. but I don't really agree yeah yeah Uh, there's so many examples to the contrary you know yeah and I think you know what it shows in Herzog's case what has sort of seen him through to this level is that he is still insatiably curious. You know, anyone who heard him talking on the Radio 5 film show 
will have heard him talking about new developments in artificial intelligence and all manner of cutting edge stuff. And I think if you can still look at the world with open eyes and find something that fascinates you, yeah, there's no reason why you can't make a great film in your 70s or 80s. Yeah, and the other part was you saying that um, it's a Japanese movie, but he doesn't try to imitate mm. the Japanese style. Yeah. Which made me think, you know, there's so many young directors who want to make their Japanese movie and they imitate yeah. the style. They sort of try to suggest that this is a Japanese movie, which I'm assuming for the Japanese audiences might be important, but at the same time, they've got 365 days of the year movies out there. Yeah, yeah. Not many, not many gaijin, as they call them, go over there and make movies. So mm. the fact that Herzog commits to what makes him him. Yeah, it's something that I didn't realize that I'd missed in in you know people aren't Japanese making Japanese movies. They no, should just it's totally true. commit to their foreignness and their otherness. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's that that's part of what makes it unique. I should point out actually, before I watched it, I was thinking about there's a film by Vim Vendors called Tokyo Ga, uh, where. Yeah. He goes around the locations used for Ozu's films. And who does he bump into in Japan but Werner Herzog? Um, which is kind of crazy. Okay. You've got a whole country there, and the two leading lights of the German new wave just bump into each other. And Herzog is very downbeat in that segment. He says that, you know, he wanted to try and find something that caught him by surprise but uh, he says I I will have to go to the moon to find a landscape that suits me uh, so it's quite pleasing a few <laughs> years on to find these walk that back a bit he's gone back to Japan thought oh yeah I could probably make a pretty good film here I mean of all the people who could make a movie on the moon I think <laughs> is yes. on that list to be fair <laughs> completely yes Um, so, on the other end of my really rather dour uh, movie, The Assistance... Dour Week, is yes. a Romanian movie. Mm. Now, now, long-term listeners of the show will know that neither me nor Graham are overly enamoured. We've with... had our problems with the Romanian new wave, yes. Yeah, I'm not going to go into it, but um, the movie that I have got is called The Whistlers, which is by oh, one of the sort of the cornerstones of um, Romanian new wave. All all of these new waves, yeah. Uh, Corneliu Porum, uh, Corneliu Porum Biau. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure. I'm, I've butchered that certainly. There's never but an old also... wave, is that? No, no. <laughs> But he did uh, 1208 East of Bucharest and Police Adjective. Ah, uh, yeah. So they're sort of big names in the Romanian New Wave. And you know when a new wave has hit its limit? Mm. When the directors sort of spread their wings a little bit? It happened with Korean New Wave when you saw uh, Park chan Wook go to America... Yeah, and yeah. Uh, Bong Joon Ho make um, ooh, the host. I guess that's really out of the wheelhouse of what made Korean New Wave. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, but this is exactly the same. It's a mm-hmm. Romanian movie, um, in which a police officer goes to the Canary Islands or the island of Gomera, mm. um, specifically as part of some plot with some lost money. Yeah. And he learns an ancient ancestral whistling language. Wowzers. Now, you compare that to what uh, Romanian New Wave is. Romanian New Wave is very political. It's very dour. It's very, your man just dies of dysentery or something for eight hours. It's very that. (laughs) Yes, yes. I mean, that's. I just, I just couldn't handle it. There's just so much dour in the world. I couldn't put up with an entire wave dedicated to it. Yes, I think. It, however, this it's totally out of that. It's mm. for, for the first thing. It's got a lot of English in it. 
Yeah. Um, Spanish as well. Uh, opens with near enough a sex scene and somebody watching it through a painting, as you do. As, yeah, as one does. Um, and it has this this whistle language. Um, it's just all over the map, really. If we're going to compare it to any like movie style, it'd be sort of the long con sort of style of movie, mm. like um, Brothers Bloom, which I don't think this is anywhere near as good as, but it, it's that style of movie. Yeah. Or, or Grifters, or, or something like this. Yeah. And it's really bizarre, because at the one hand, he, 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 the leopard can't change its spots entirely, so mm. the, the tone of the whistlers, the way the scenes are shot, every... I don't know if it's a Europe, certain parts of Europe, um, classical J- Japanese cinema has this thing where they hold a shot longer than they need to. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or they'll have like a shot of someone getting a glass of water that'll take like two minutes. Yeah. And it's certain shots are, are as long as they possibly can can be, you know. Yeah. So it has this feel of, of just extended length mm. of very serious Romanian um, things and issues and it talks about police corruption and, and whatnot but at the same time it's actually really rather goofy right so personally I had an awkward um, time sort of coming to terms with with what it is you know mm. because on the one hand it's about somebody well, there's a scene in it where a filmmaker walks into a warehouse says, I really like this building. Can you have a look inside? I'd like to shoot inside of it. And then they kill him. Right. Just like that. It's it's played sort of as a gag, essentially. Yeah. As a very dark comedy gag. Because that, that is what a Romanian New Wave was sold as a lot of the time. They, sort of, they shrugged away a lot of the harshness of their their visions as dark comedy. Yeah, and I think sometimes that was maybe a way of getting people through the door more than it was a fair description of the tone. Yeah, I can't remember what the one was called, but it was about the guy who was um, in hospital and nothing went right for him. The death of Mr. Lazarescu, yeah. Yeah, that was sort of the the, the straw that broke its camel's back as far as me and the Romanian New Wave were going. Because mm-hmm. it was just sold as a black uh, dark comedy. It's it's not. It's just nah. not. No, it's not. Behave. <laughs> just behave calm things out. <laughs> but this, it, it genuinely is. It's, it's it's not funny so much. It's sort of like a sense of quirk about it. Mm. If he's going to throw any other sort of examples for things it sort of touches upon, I can't quite remember the name of the movie, but it was a few years ago. It has Chris Emsworth, Jeff Bridges as a hotel. Oh, uh, um, Bad Times at the Yellow Royale. Yes, it's got sort of aspects of a hotel that sort of pop up within it. Mm. And the person who like, is at the front of that hotel isn't quite what they're saying. It, it's got like people getting their, no- their throats slit. Mm. And the end of it, there's a massive shootout, which is actually... It's got a realism to it. It's not overly stylized, but because they've shot it in a picturesque place rather than abandoned warehouse district 17. Yeah. You can really see the, sort of the, the cinema, cinematography of Romanian cinema sort of come to the fore. Mm. Because I, I don't know about anybody else, but when I talk about cinematography, it's the colours, it's the visuals as well, the camera movement, which matters to me. Yeah. And when it's just, ca- it's just well photographed, Desolate landscapes. I, I can't quite invest in that that yeah. style of cinematography. Um, I, mean, I guess I'm more of a, a stylist, really, with what I like. No, I think I'm similar. I understand what you mean. But uh, this, it looks great. I mean, the fact that a Romanian film ends in a shootout. If you told me that ten years ago, <laughs> yes. I'd have walked out the room. Yeah. <laughs> But at the same time, it, it's it's coming to terms with those two things. I don't think it negotiates it as well as it could. Believe me, as far as liking a Romanian movie, this is 
leagues ahead of anything I've seen before. Yeah, I, I think I think you experienced one as well. Uh, Afarim was it? Which... Afarim is very interesting. Yeah, uh, the guy who did that, Christy Pu, uh, has done a number of things, including the astonishingly titled "I Do Not Care If We Go Down in History" as barbarians, and he's oh, that's fun. That's a good one. But he's still got a few of those Romanian cinematics, but I think he's outgrowing them and finding a more personal kind of set of interests. Yeah, I mean, I'd I'd say this is the same here too. Mm. It's sort of a director stretching their legs. Yeah. They've not quite found the ground and not quite found the footing yet, but you can see the germ of who this director could be. I've got that wrong, by the way. It's interesting to see. Oh, sorry. It's interesting to see what... hmm? I've got that wrong, by the way. It was uh, Radu Jude who did uh, who did Afrin. Sorry, carry on. Oh, but it's still the point stands. Yeah, but essentially, yeah, it's like a director finding the legs, but they're not quite got it yet. Mm. There's like ideas that land, bits of execution that land. I'm not sure that the non-linearity helps it really. Mm. It just sort of mm. obfus- obfuscates matters a little bit unnecessarily. Well, you don't know where yeah. you... There's no real tell as to where you are in the timeline or, or whatnot. And I don't think it furthers things by having non-linearity as a sort of a way of telling its story. Because I do think yeah. some directors use that rather lazily. As a um, kind of way is, of, yeah, saying that this is more than it is, yeah. I, mean, I don't think um, this is as bad as some things that have done it by a long shot, but no. as much as this does... Right, and as much as this shows a director really trying to find himself, mm. he's also hamstrung by his traditions, which you know it's the right path to be on. I'm looking forward to see what the guy whose name I'm not going to pro- attempt to pronounce uh, does next, because <laughs> yes. I think he's on the right path for you know being one of those directors who stands out from a movement like the Park Chan Wook, like the Kim Ji Woon. Mm. Uh, did for um, Korea. Yeah. Because I don't think Romanian New Wave has that yet. No, I would agree with that, yeah. I mean, Iranian cinema has it too, where the, the names just sort of leapt out from the others. Yeah, yeah. No, you... Well, we've mentioned them, haven't we? Yakira Stamis and all, all of those Macmal Baths. Slightly too many Macmal Baths, in my opinion, but they're all good. Not the one who did the separation, though. He totally shouldn't be standing out <laughs> over anything, really. He's like the he's like the Iranian equivalent of a Romanian director, though, isn't he? It's like I cannot get over the fact that so many people saw all those Iranian neo-realist films and thought ah, it's good, but it would be better if the visuals weren't amazing. And then Asghar Fahadi comes along and sing Hallelujah. We've got one that looks like it was made on a potato. <laughs> yeah, cause I remember, I don't know when it was on, I think it was on the show, oh, it might not have been. The Apple. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. You recommended it. Yeah. The Apple is a gorgeous movie. It genuinely is. Just this little kid discovering what is and what isn't mm-hmm. real and, you know, what she can and can't do. It's got a, such a sense of discovery and wonder about it. Yeah. And then I can't remember what it was. It wasn't a, a separation, it was one after it. The salesman, wasn't it, that you did on the yeah, show that's once? The one, yeah. yeah. And to see that the, cl- the claim that this guy's got, it was a moment of, what? Him? Really? Are you sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, yeah, Romania doesn't have that, mm. that those champions that lead the field just yeah. yet. But I think this guy has a fair claim, probably with his next movie. I think he'll really break through. That's interesting. I'm tempted to check that out, if only for a whistling-based language. And their whistle well loud. (laughs) They describe it as putting your knuckle in your mouth and pointing towards your ear, like the bullet would come through your ear. And then whistle. Wow. And to learn how to whistle, you've got to go in the ocean and swim in the ocean, apparently, because that, that helps. Of course you do. Because I guess you'll, if you whistle extra loud after you'll come out, you'll clear all the salt water out of your ears. That must be it. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I can rationalise any old rubbish. 
Well, in today's world, I think we have to, really, don't we? It's, it's a vital survival skill. <laughs> yes. So yes, uh, that's been Cinema Collective's streaming special. Next week, uh, we ran a director's lottery. The uh, I think it was just last week we did, and it came out with Wes Craven. And we decided, after some deliberation, to do The People Under the Stairs, which is, you know, one of the ones that kind of slips through the net a bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's of that... What was the one I did? Uh, Serpent and the Rainbow. It's mm. that sort of... It has its fans. Yeah. But it kind of gets lost under the weight of Scream, of Nightmare uh, Hills of Eyes. Street. and Yeah. yeah. yeah that, that sort of, that, his major trifecta, so... All good looking at those lesser regarded ones. Completely, yeah, yeah. I'm interested to look at that because it does like Serpent of the Rainbow, as you say, it does have a passionate fan base, even if it's not as big a fan base as some of his others. And yeah, I want to see what they're raving about. But until then, uh, until next week with People Under the Stairs, that's been a lot from Cinema Eclectica. I've been Graham. And I've been Rob. See you next week. Mm-hmm.